I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague George Roberts from Oxford Brooks University, who ran Oxford Brooks' first MOOC last April, First Steps into Learning and Teaching, and he's going to tell us a bit about that and guide us through some discussions. I guess I'm so. Um, well, I changed the title at the last minute, as you do, and so oops for the rest of us, <laughs> uh, because actually, as I think Alison was suggesting, there are um, each one of the terms in massive, open, online, and indeed course is problematic, and I'm not going to go through sort of all of the problems there, but I thought open online courses is probably more what I'm going to be talking about than massive, because, well, what is massive? Um, we, we've had the, the background, I don't think we need to go into it, but the sort of the C MOOCs, the connectivist MOOCs, where it all started, and then X MOOCs from uh, taking off from edX, the collaboration between Harvard and MIT. Um, C MOOCs typically sort of, you know, from a few hundred to a few thousand, um, and then the Stanford Artificial Intelligence sort of exploding with 120,000 and, you know, pushing 200,000 on the first MIT. Anyway, um, C MOOCs, X MOOCs formed the background. 2012 was widely regarded as the year of the MOOC. Um, but what was our MOOC? Um, first Steps into Learning and Teaching in Higher Education, um, FSLT 12. It was described by Lisa <coughs> Lane and Jenny McNess as a small task-based MOOC. So we had T MOOCs. And then um, uh, Yishe Moore described the old MOOC, the, um, op uh, the Open Learning Design MOOC at the Open University and Institute of Education as a P MOOC, a project-based MOOC. There's a lot of proliferation in the MOOC world. Um, so we ran First Steps into Learning and Teaching in Higher Education last May, and we will be running it again as an open online course, um, free to all, in May this year. Anybody who's interested in educational development, this is the plug, please do join us. Um, it was great fun. Um, but the beasts, if you like, are circling in the jungle. Because, um, just to, to bring it into a, a wider discourse of higher education, um, discourses around higher education are fields of competition for the legitimate exercise of symbolic violence, if you want, or at least an arena of conflict between rival principles of legitimacy, competitions for political, economic, and cultural power. And I see MOOCs as being a, an arena within which these tensions are being played out. Um, the connectivist MOOCs and people who sort of insisted that it's not a MOOC unless it's uh, got a particular ideology behind it, and other people say, well, no, it's MOOC if it's massive. There was lots of arguments about what constitutes legitimate educational practice being played out between the proponents of different forms of learning. Um, so I want to start off with just a little bit of an illustration of how this plays out. This is Kathy Davidson's blog of her book, Now You See It. Um, recommended reading, interesting, challenging, um, controversial. But she poses an entrance examination for the 21st century university. If SOPA, SOPA is the Stop Online Piracy Act, and PIPA is its analog in the United States Congress, a Senate, which is the Protection of Intellectual Property Act. If either of these laws had been passed in 2002, she asks, would Wikipedia exist today? If either law had passed in 2012, and our uh, Digital Economy Act was the analog, um, same problems, same underlying principles, same proponents, same opponents, if these laws had been passed, would Wikipedia exist in 2022? Why or why not discuss? And I'm not going to ask you to discuss this question. I'm going to step right on to the next thing which she says, which is, if you cannot answer that question, you are not literate, nor are you in control of your life, <laughs> she would challenge, even if you think you are. So I'm not going to sort of ask you to expose your levels of uh, digital, political, cultural literacy in, in this particular discussion, but I am going to use it to sort of frame up 
the question, because I think engagement in massive or otherwise open online courses are about this digital literacy question. Um, because the big beasts are going to come around and bite some of us in the bottom. Um, literacy, including digital literacy, is the practice of speaking to a community, enunciating, if you like, speaking in the broadest sense, projecting your identity with, through, and to others who at least are willing to listen to you and kind of understand what you might be talking about. Um, at least, you know, you're within the frame of a language and a, you know, community of higher education and so on. We can use acronyms without too much fear, those kind of things. They don't they may concur, but at least understand. So the question that I wanted to start you off with at each one of your tables, I'm going, there's going to be three questions. I may skip the second, uh, the second one because I think it's largely what Allison has explored in, in her talk, so I don't want to to cover the same ground. I'd like you to just briefly on your table, can you say, might this, these things, these moves, help address what I'll call a digital literacy <coughs> deficit? Um, table uh, two, I think, uh, identified reluctance, uh, a question, the uh, skills that learners have. So I'm wondering whether, rather than saying they aren't skilled enough to do it, can say, can these things perhaps be a means of remediation, if you like? So, so no more than about two or three minutes on each, you know, on each table. Do you think that MOOCs may have a role to play in respect to addressing this perceived digital literacy deficit? Okay, can I, can I interrupt you? Just as, as you're, as, just as you're getting going, some of the sort of terms I've been hearing coming around are it's like visibility, um, the visibility of the technology and the motivation to use it. Um, any views on MOOCs as a means of addressing this question of skills, literacies in respect of the digital? We kind of felt there's got to be a kind of baseline competency because um, otherwise people are going to be floundering. So people with no previous experience of technology will, will really struggle. But then we had the other argument that if you're part of a, commu a local community to support you, then you're more likely to overcome these hurdles. Uh huh. So so you may go into it as it were naive, but find a community within it that would support. I, I agree that it is far more complex, and we're opening up the question, and it, we only have until lunch, so. <laughs> <laughs> Just to follow up the idea of a baseline, I think actually the need for a baseline level digital literacy will increase the deficit between those who are enabled and yeah. those who are not, because the ones who have some sort of baseline have that to build on, the ones who never yeah. achieve baseline were, are not invited to I that. think that's a really significant question about whether you know, will will this deficit actually increase or decrease? And I think that's I think that's a challenge that anybody entering into this world will have to ask. Well, without the technology to be truly intuitive, someone's going to miss out on the ability yeah. to use it. Uh, yeah. we, were yeah. <laughs> we were expressing some 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 doubts and concerns here yeah. about, about how effective it could be. Since you've introduced the politics, can I, I'll, I'll get out on a limb and be even more challenging myself because of fundamental because the whole ethos of the MOOC is about openness and it's about freedom. It's about the free market of knowledge and learning. And what we know about free markets yeah. is that they favor those people with the most capital who are therefore able to command the market and the operation. Okay, the all right, yeah. The people who don't have it are left in the ship. Yeah. The way you, only way you can deal with that is to control it and therefore structure it, which is a contradiction yeah. to the idea of the MOOC. Yeah. I think there is a fundamental tension there. 
And you have uh, Alison. Uh, I was going to say that um, digital literacies are situated practices. MOOCs yeah. are diverse. Yeah. Uh, what is a MOOC? What is a course? You know? yeah. um, and therefore, we have to bear that in mind. <coughs> that even if you are literate in one type of MOOC, which could be highly structured or unstructured, um, it's very different from other types yeah. of MOOCs. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you picked up on another thing, which was the, um, the sort of self effective learner, the sort of kind of falling back on a notion of an individual or probably even possibly taken out of the community, the idea that a person could be a self-effective learner without reference to the milieu, the context, politics even. Uh, one more comment, then I'm going to move on. There was somebody back. Yeah, I was just going to say, won't um, Facebook do this job for us? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so you could say, yes, MOOCs will be a good way of addressing the yeah. deficit because yeah. if people are interested and motivated to sign up for a MOOC, then that's one of the key things. That Is Facebook just a MOOC with a billion members? <laughs> so, so from that point of view, if you get the motivation out basic kind of digital skills that come from that kind of connection, connectionist approach that you get within Facebook, with people making their own community, they're yeah. finding out information, do we need to work? I'll say yes, but I'll talk to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this is, this is the digital native, if you like, um, the dying digital native. Um, there have been several different typologies. We're may, familiar with the digital native? Typology and the problem mathics with it um, that uh, Dave White and Alison LeCornu then came and sort of proposed a visitor resident <coughs> model, um, Dana Boyd, the voyeur flanner model, and I and my colleague Marion Wade are following this sort of a similar trap, the sort of binary oppositions, but we will come up with a discussion, I'll talk about this a little bit more, of the liminal participant versus the skilled orienteer as being a way of describing the kinds of ways that people participated in our MOOC and with a little bit of reading beyond that into the emergent literature, the way we see participation in MOOCs evolving or in open online courses evolving. Um, the idea that we are still, if you like, very, very early in all of this. These are the oral poets sitting around their campfires um, with their headphones and so on. We are at a stage that people in the distant future may sort of look back to the way we look back to Homer and uh, the Iliad. And these kinds of things have taught us to see the world, are teaching us to see the world in a way which I think is analogous to the way perspective drawing taught us to see the world. We are seeing the world in new ways, but we aren't even aware that this is happening in 1481, this painting was absolutely radical. Nobody could see the world in three dimensions reduced to two. There have been all sorts of little experiments, in it, but all of a sudden the idea of perspective drawing came and changed the way we were able to represent our understanding of the world. And I think we're at a similar sort of juncture in the e-learning or learning technology or possibly just <coughs> the world of learning as a result of the digital cultures that are emerging around us. Um, Richard Hall suggests that open academic practice op offers a radical challenge to what he, well it's not, he, he's drawing on a lot of sort of political, the sort of polyarchic limits, that there are a certain number of nodes of control in institutions which limit the discussion of the digital literacy because institutions are in conflict with themselves. This openness versus closeness, accreditation non-accreditation. What is it that we sell? If I put my lectures on the web, students won't come to class anymore. These, these, all this sort of discussion around what is openness in higher education and institutions don't know whether they want to be open or closed. Um, so, MOOC experiences comes from a paper that Marion, myself, um, Liz Lovegrove, and who else was contributing to that paper? Um, Liminal Participants and Skilled Orienteers, a case study of learner participation in a MOOC for new lecturers. Um, well, 200 people signed up. It was massive as far as my educational <coughs> development practice goes. Um, I've never had 200 people in, a, in any one of the courses that I've run. 60 people participated throughout the six weeks. 
We reached our intended constituency. We weren't aiming at MOOC participants. We were aiming at new lecturers in higher education. So we had a curriculum that we were trying to deliver. We didn't want to just be a MOOC about MOOCs. Um, 24 different countries, Australia, Canada, India, South Africa, as well as many European and US participants. But research is continuing, particularly into how people learn, what the differences in their participation was, whoops, uh, and, and looking at design principles. Um, Marion proposes and I go along with it, that MOOCs themselves are, or this open <coughs> online course thing, um, is a threshold concept. That they open a portal to understanding previously unknown knowledge. They make explicit things which had previously been tacit, possibly only accidentally. They are preceded by sort of troublesome knowledge and this notion of liminality being in a suspended state of partial understanding or a stuck place. And I think we're all there. The question that was proposed and the group that finally won suggests that we all have very different views about what massiveness is, openness is, online is, and courses are. All of these concepts leave us kind of stuck in the middle of it, wrestling with what is this thing that we're doing here? What's being opened up by the MOOC? Um, we came up in our little MOOC with three main themes that seemed to shape or to, yeah, the discussion focused on three main themes. Uh, just a reminder on the, we, we questionnaires, um, online focus groups, and individual interviews were conducted with about 40 of the 60 participants who made it all the way through. We made a big effort to contact the people that left early and got about 20 of them to come back and say, why did they drop out? Why didn't they participate? What was going on? And we did text analysis on the blogs, on the tweets, and on the discussion forum posts that were used. Um, but three main themes, navigation, this concept of transformative reflective practice, and making sense of community. I think that's been picked up in a couple of places. Literacy is a situated practice. It's not something that you do yourself. You need to have others with you. So as far as navigation, we found that particularly new participants, and we began to make a distinction between new participants and experienced learners, because in our MOOC there were <coughs> About 30%, 20-30% of the people who signed up were old hands at MOOCs. They, we'd seen them at CCK 08, we'd seen them at CCK 10, um, several people had done DS 106, and so on and so forth. So there were, there were some old hands, there were some, some, if you like, established MOOCers. But there were also a lot of people for whom not only was this the first open on, massive open online course that they had done, it was the first online learning they had done at all. They'd never engaged in uh, asynchronous discussion forums for learning. So there's quite a range of participation. New participants were overwhelmed by the technology, multiple channels, and perceived the need to multitask. Uh, so I think it was at the back table you were talking about um, the burden of expectation. There's so, you know, all of a sudden there's 300 people contributing to a discussion forum and you feel you have to read it all before you can um, Whereas the experienced MOOCers, if that's the right word, were judicious about planning their route and orienting their participation. And we started to play with this concept of liminality and orienteering. And the people that were experienced just didn't bother to participate everywhere. Um, they chose a few forums, they maybe focused their conversation there, they, they decided how much they wanted to do some wanted to lurk. Some were, if you like, active lurkers. Others were passive lurkers. This transformative reflective practice became important. And we saw that and this may tie in with Allison's um, self-effective learners. People who were new, who so engaged and thought, and obviously through their posts, through their tweets, through their blogs, whatever their mode of engagement was, made an visibly active attempt to make sense of things and it moved on. They experienced a transformative shift 
in the five week, five sort of focused weeks of the course. They develop significant new knowledge about their learning and their own learning efficacy. But it required reflection on practice, it required community support. They didn't do it on their own. The experienced MOOCers, if you like, were, bless them, they were a really welcoming community. There weren't, it, it, I don't know if we got lucky or maybe, I, I don't know exactly how it happened, but people were, said, you know, Oh, it's so great to see so many new people here. I've been in so many MOOCs in which there were, you know, I knew everybody, but now here's people that I've never seen before, and welcoming them in and um, helping them to make sense. And, oh, don't worry if you can't post to everything. It's, um, so the, we didn't design it that way, but the experienced participants were an absolutely instrumental part for, of the successful transformation that the new learners made. And finally, so making sense of community. The new learners needed time to determine their audience and who their core community was. I think that was picked up uh, somewhere uh, over here earlier. That um, until they sort of got a sense of who they were speaking to, they didn't feel comfortable. But when they got a sense that, all right, these are the sort of 10, 15, 20 people who are, in effect, my <coughs> audience for this moment. And that's not necessarily everybody there amongst even the 200 or the 60 who went all the way through. Um, but identifying your audience. It's like being in a lecture situation, picking the, talking to the friendly person in the room. Even if there's 300 people there, you talk to two or three people. And that was the kind of experience that the participants seemed to have. They needed to realize reciprocal relationships. That if, the, if you post and nobody answers, you sort of drift away, especially if you're unfamiliar with it. But if somebody answers, you get drawn in. So I think there were lessons there for the organizers of MOOCs about how to scaffold the first few days of something that is, that is massive. And it took a lot of work the first few days. Um, so, this is the question I'm going to skip in the interest of getting towards lunch. Um, I want you to keep these, whoops, the, the, the two points in your mind. What has the MOOC been, experience been like for you? And I think we, we surfaced some of that previously. And the answers to the question that Allison posed suggest to me that there are, have been experiences of MOOCs and they have been different. But if you could sort of, as we go through the next bit, um, think of yourself in a liminal state of participation, or would you call yourself a skilled orienteer? In my view, we're all liminal participants. If we think of ourselves as being the skilled orienteer, perhaps we will inhibit our own learning, but maybe, <coughs> that's, maybe I'm being unfair. Um, so... Forget the massive. Oops for the rest of us. Um, MOOCs are a rapidly hybridizing novel expression of higher education. They are changing like mad. C MOOCs, X MOOCs, P MOOCs, etc. MOOCs. Um, people are coming up with typologies. Um, Kurt Bonk, I um, cite him a little bit later, has identified, I think, 22. Uh, as of last month, 22 different types of MOOC, not just 22, but 22 different categories of MOOC, with 12 different business models and 30 different motivations. For so this uh, intermediate forms, syntheses, compromises, and novel solutions arrive. Who did the Edinburgh um, digital, uh, e-learning and digital cultures MOOC? Because they were conscious of, of being a hybrid form of MOOC between the C MOOC and the X MOOC, the Coursera X MOOC. The, uh, I won't go into the typologies, but they were conscious of using intentional social media conversations outside the Coursera platform, and this this use of intentional external platforms, if you like, was part of the hybridity that was exercised within that particular call it a MOOC. Um, but also, as Bonnie Stewart says, uh, that 
MOOCs have become a proxy for the historical conversation about continuing professional, open, online, distance, and blended learning. She has a very interesting... Uh, one of the things we were talking about just before coming up here um, was that the, an awful lot of the work on MOOCs is still anecdotal in the gray literature, in the blog sphere, not peer-reviewed. Bonnie's writing in her blog um, about the experience of open courses before there were online courses. She talks about what if Foucault ran a MOOC um, when he was professor at the University of Paris, he was required, as a condition of his post, to give open public lectures. And they had to, you know, he packed the house, and they had to find other rooms, and they had to find other rooms, they had to find other rooms, and set up microphones, and stuff, because he was such a popular speaker. The idea that there, you were obliged, as a public intellectual, to speak to as wide an audience as possible. You see Michael Sandel now in the Justice at Harvard series kind of doing the same thing, but because he's got Harvard behind him and public television in Boston, he can, if you like, reach that audience of many, many thousands that was not available in, in the past. Um, so MOOCs are still part of this ongoing conversation about what open, what online is. Um, yes, it's my MOOC. No, it's my MOOC. That's not a MOOC. It's your MOOC. No, that's not. Uh, squabbling around the MOOCs and the number of arguments that I started to get into and then heard myself getting into them and said, no, 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 I'm not going to go there, about whether such and such a thing was a MOOC or not. That's not a MOOC because it's not connectivist. Or, um, anyway, uh, the problem that we perceive is that if you focus on the course and the platform, you end up ignoring the experience of the learner. And the learner experience is what is critical, because no matter how you design it, once you make it open, people can come in from anywhere, and there's an unlimited number of possibilities for hybridization. My experience will be different. My experience of the... Old's MOOC will be different than somebody else's experience. My experience of DS-106 will be different from other people's experiences. I'm not doing them for credit, but some people might be doing them for credit. There's unlimited possibilities because whatever else, MOOCs offer participants the opportunity, whether they're able to take it is another question, an opportunity to fashion their own learning according to their needs. So yes, I think there is a bubble. And uh, as somebody mentioned hype earlier, I think we're sort of approaching the top of Gartner's hype cycle. We are at the peak of inflated expectations. And I expect that we are going to be slipping into what Gartner calls the trough of despond. Um, so uh, I hope we're not all going to slip into the trough and then sort of, you know, come up and there will be something that sustains, something that comes out of it. But the number of MOOCs that are around at the moment is quite frightening. Uh, Bonk identifies 22 types, 20 leadership principles. The numbers are changing, boundaries are fuzzy, but it's clear that there is something going on in Harvard, in MIT, at the Open University, universities of Edinburgh, um, Madrid, Catalonia, um, and we don't know what's going to happen, but I suspect it's going to pop somehow, and there will be some who don't survive, and there will be some who do. Does anybody remember um, a few years back, there was a British version of eBay? Um, no. Um, and there's some cowboy economics going on, too, with the attempt to monetize MOOCs. You monetize accreditation. That's the path that we're taking. We're suggesting to ourselves that uh, there will be people who will enjoy studying in this environment, but some of whom will want to acquire that certificate that the university offers that can be transferred as credit to other university courses, backed up by a quality assurance regime, recognized by other institutions. So 200, 300 people sign up, if 25 of them pay 
385 pounds for 10 credits, then, hey, we've, we've probably done about what we need to do from it. Um, whether that's the same as 125 people studying at Stanford with 125,000 people online, I don't know. Um, you might uh, monetize tuition, offer uh, extra places. Uh, somebody suggested Elsevier's business MOOC and all of a sudden study centers pop up. Recruitment is another one. Um, or do you do what the big players have done, which is sell picks and shovels to the Klondikers, MOOCs as a platform. The big MOOCs, the, the first massive X MOOCs came out of Stanford. Um, Sebastian Thrun taught uh, the artificial intelligence course. He went off and said, I can reach more people than ever, and he spun out a company called Udacity, quit his professorship, and went off to do that as well as his little day job at, Moog, at, at Google. But really. um, so he went and spun off a platform, and Udacity now offers a range of courses. Stanford arguably went, eek, oh my god, and they set up Coursera, spun out a platform. The Open University with FutureLearn arguably is spinning out a platform. And they're trying to, if you like, sell the platforms to the people like the rest of us, who would like to run a MOOC? Oh, we've got to get on the Coursera platform. We've got to get on the future. We've got to get on a platform. Um, so the money in the original MOOCs seems to be not in the learning experience itself, but in the provision of the tools by which other people might set up. Um, so forget the massive. Um, what are the reasons for developing open online courses? Um, and these, we sat down, um, Ron and myself, some colleagues, and uh, looked at the literature and looked at what we were doing and decided that there were a number of reasons that an institution might go into selling them. We might do it because we want to improve the global learner experience. It just might be the right thing to do. Uh, we might be fulfilling the university's social, global, community educative mission. We might be enhancing reputation and increasing visibility, though noted the risks of reputational collapse if it's not good enough. We might be showcasing our expertise. We might be selling books. MIT, um, the first course, um, circuits and electronics course, um, gave away a free PDF version of the, um, of the lead course designer lecturer's uh, well-known book. Um, Elsevier, it wasn't Elsevier, sorry, I've forgotten the publisher for a moment, um, said, then went out and said, or you can, you know, for $29.95 or whatever it is, you can buy the version that has the CD in the back and the link to the online resources and the interactive extras. And they sold a huge number on the back of giving away the free content as a PDF and the people enrolling on the course. So there was a, I don't know whether MIT got a percentage of that probably did, but I don't know. Um, or indeed, increasing reach, better serving existing clients, attracting new clients. And I put it intentionally in there down at the bottom to earn more revenue, because I don't think MOOCs are primarily going to be about earning revenue directly for the institution. They may very well be about attracting new people in. They may very well be about selling books or selling some accreditation. I don't think they're going to transform the cash flow of the normal old sort of, not the MITs of the world. Um, but I think it's something we need to think about. Um, so what were the pedagogies that seemed to be significant to us in our MOOC? This question of expert participation just came up again and again and again. I wouldn't have got nearly so much out of this course if it hadn't been for the old hands that were there to help me through. Um, we started to experiment with this a few years back in um, a course that we ran for the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, inviting last year's participants to join the course team for, you know, for free. You have an opportunity to do it again. <laughs> um, and, and not only that, you have to write a post every week and summarize it. And people queue up to come along and be expert participants to, to take the course again. And that's sort of rolling along. So this was a little experiment in a closed course, which typically has 25 people on it. Um, we saw this happening spontaneously 
in an open course with 200 people on it, and we've decided to formalize this as one of the things that we've learned about learning, that if you bring last year's students back, they help this year's students learn. I think we probably already knew that, but it's nice to see it sort of happen again, as it were, before your eyes without you really planning it. Um, distributed collaboration is also crucial and extremely difficult. Group work, we know, is hard, even face-to-face -face group work. You do it at distance, it's even harder. But nonetheless, if you can get groups of people working at distance, collaborating on a task, so for us, the people working together to do something is so much more important than the individual engaging with content as a solitary act. So distributed collaboration, I think, is crucial. <coughs> Social citation, I added just briefly, just right now, really, because people were talking about, I mean, Alison asked if you use social media. Well, social citation, sharing an annotated bibliography is another um, crucial act in academic online learning. Academic multimedia and flipped teaching. Um, Flipped teaching, familiar term? Who's heard of flipped teaching? Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, observatory, uh, was Eric Mazur, I think, originally conceived it. Um, the Observatory of Borderless Education calls it the new blended learning, hence my slightly tongue in cheek flipped teaching is simply the new black. Um, that um, the idea is that the lecture becomes the homework and you do the homework in the classroom. Okay? Um, so, academic multimedia, recording the lecture, playing it back in your own room, and then going and talking about it together in the class, rather than sitting in a class watching a lecture and then going and talking about it in the bar, or wherever it is you might talk about it. Uh, so these seem to be the pedagogies for us that are significant, and how you instantiate them in an open online course, and how you instantiate them massively in an open online course is, is, is the challenge to us. So, finally, the last question before lunch. Um, if on your tables you could have a discussion, I would like to know from each table one or two reasons that you might have for developing uh, brackets massive, um, and I've even gone around to putting the word courses in quotation marks because I'm not sure where the scale is. I, I don't think we're talking necessarily about courses in the sense of something that leads to a BA or even a single module. We might be talking about smaller interventions. So each table, no more than uh, sort of three or four minutes, uh, two reasons for developing open online courses of the sort that we have been talking about. Okay, um, can we see if we can find some, a range of reasons for possibly entering into this, into this world? I, uh, when we did it, I, I, I went to my boss and I said, well, I'd like to bid for this project. I think we're going to do this. Kind of, and then she said, oh, that sounds really boring. What would you really like to do? I said, I'd like to do a, turn the, oh, the, the new lecturer's course into a MOOC. That would be fun, she said. <laughs> um, so anyway, fun. Yeah. Uh, as a preparation for higher education and online study, we put distance courses that are having trouble with students arriving without their academic or digital literacy. So we're preparing, yeah. uh, pre preparing for postgraduate study. Yeah, well, preparing for, for particularly postgraduate study. Yeah. yeah. From, and, and because the cohorts tend to be mature distance learners who have been out of education for a long time and don't necessarily have a digital literacy as well and are having crises mid-course, we're trying to put the crises pre-course. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, yes. So, so uh, kind of pre-course induction on yes. uh, I've kind of got loads of stuff out there as open materials. It's not a MOOC in that I don't expect people to turn up and go. Yeah. It's just out there. And it's my own professional raising my own awareness of what I do professionally and it's for the institution as, as outreach. And it's, it's aimed at uh, yeah. possible students and teachers teaching students. Um, I was just going to say,
say you have postgraduate, we also do this for international students to help acclimatise them to the. Ah, yes, yes. Not. Um, other, others, other, yeah. Uh, staff development for the course teams themselves. Um, what kind of course teams doing open online courses? Uh, no, no, sorry. Um, as in teaching. So you mentioned that the the MOOC platforms they also offer a lot of staff development to actually understand what it takes to run one of these courses. Right. Huh? They're competing with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, any, I'll, I'll get back to you. Any others from? Um, bringing together different sectors. So you could have people in higher education sector, in the private sector, in the third sector. Uh huh. So it cuts across those boundaries. Now, I'm interesting about the, the, the discussion about shell and sort of identities and open. Yeah, but bringing together different sectors. Public, private, and third, I can read it. <laughs> um, well, Chuck is the one that I said to you, which is an experimental course. Yeah, oh, yeah, yes. Or piloting a course idea. Mm. <laughs> Any other, other ideas? Yeah. Uh, recruitment. Recruitment, yeah. Um, yeah. Global citizenship. Global citizenship. Mm. <coughs> yeah, okay. So, now, the reason, preparation for study, postgraduate, <coughs> international students, and indeed undergraduate, um, uh, personal, personal professional profile and outreach, um, possibly separate uh, categories, Staff development in running MOOCs themselves, but also staff development in simply teaching in higher education. Absolutely. I mean, we're being pressed all the time to, you know, <coughs> PhD students who are now doing seminars, but we make a promise to all of our students <coughs> that everybody that teaches them will have a qualification to teach. How do you get all these PhD students into the into a teaching course while running open online courses? Maybe a way of addressing some of that. Um, Experiments, pilots, recruitment. Is anybody doing any of this now? Yes, I know you are. <laughs> yeah. In development. So in development. Yeah. yeah. In development. I've done flipped learning. I'm developing. Done, done flipped learning. Okay. Um, well, thank you all very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you for letting me rant on a little bit about uh, about MOOCs. Um, yeah, the oops, it's backwards. So, yeah, um, just wanted to end there, and I think just to put up the last bit, which is, what is it? Come on, right? The copyright and takedown notice, uh -huh. because people may be recording this. Um, if you are a rights holder and concerned that some of the images that you have seen may be used somewhere else, um, anyway, well, we are trying to sort of move into some sort of responsibility in respect of the. Uh, use of images properly or improperly, um, taking into account what has to be done when you work in this world. So anyway, thank you all very much for your participation. I hope I haven't kept you too late for lunch.